we got to look to God's Word. That's what we're here to do. We're here to get filled up. We're here to get ready for the week, for the rest of the month. September is halfway over already. Fall is on the way. Pumpkin spice lattes are in the ladies' hands. Christmas is around the corner. It's too far. I went too far, didn't I? No, I know some people really love Christmas. But God is so good, and He has been so good to us. And I hope and I pray that you have been here for the last two weeks, or you have been watching for the last two weeks. And if you haven't, man, you got to get caught up. Because we are in this series, and we're talking about this topic, that if you weren't here for the first week, or you haven't listened or watched the first week, you'll be able to understand where we're going. But the foundation is so important to where we've been and where we're going. And so if you weren't here for the last few weeks, in week one we talked about these providential principles, these these things, this issue of God moving and directing in our lives and how there's these everyday things that happen and take place, but every now and then God's sovereign hand comes in and shows us something miraculous and spectacular. And God can do that in our lives. And you need this foundation. So I I promise you, I know I say it every time I'm up here, if you weren't here for week one, make sure that you listen, you will be filled with a wealth of knowledge, I promise you. Last week, we learned about providential provision, this idea that God can provide when you need Him to. God can step into your life and He can do a work if you'll allow Him to and you will trust Him, you will get up and go and trust that God will do something in your life. And today we are going to talk about another providential principle. And the thing that I want to talk to you about today is simply providential protection. I am thankful for God's protection. God has seen me through enough. I'm good. I don't need any more. I've seen enough. Some of you, God has seen you through things that you tell people your story and they go, there's no way that could be anything other than God. And we look through scripture and we look through God's word and through story after story after story and we see God's moving in the lives of people to watch over them and protect them as they go about doing what God has called them to do. Your reading for this week was found in Daniel chapter 3, but before we dig into that story a little bit, I have to give you a little bit of background. I love the Old Testament. I am an old school, middle-aged man. I turned 35 this week, this past week. I know. Do you know how sick, no, don't clap because it's horrible, okay? It's horrible. This is how sick my family is. My mother walked into my office on my birthday, and she said, hey, happy birthday, Luke. And I said, thanks, Mom. And she was like, love you, and said all the stuff that moms are supposed to say. And then she was like, well, you're halfway done. And I was like, what are you talking about? She's like, God only promised us 70 years, so you're halfway there, buddy. Like, that is so hurtful. And I was really taken back by it. And I was like, man, I'm getting old, I'm getting old. But in Bible, in in church years, I'm way older, right? I've grown up in church. I've grown up listening to these Old Testament stories over and over and over again. And there is nothing like them. I'm telling you, you want to read your kids a bedtime story, crack open the Old Testament. Careful which one that you read before bed. But read them some of these stories of God moving and God providing and God protecting. And so before we take a look at our story today that we want to dig into, a quick background of it. In Daniel chapter 1, King Nebuchadnezzar of the Babylonians comes and takes Jerusalem. He overthrows Jerusalem. And as he does this, he takes a few young men with him. The Bible says that they are are nobles, that they're intellectuals, that they learn quickly, that they're wise. And so kids out there, do your homework, pay attention in school, it's important. And that he takes these young men, brings them back, and they are now put in this group where they're going to be fed the king's food, and they're going to drink the king's wine, and they're going to be part of this little special group that's been taken. And of course, we know that four of them are Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. 
you know them better as their names are then changed to Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego. And they're taken into this group and they're told, listen, we're going to feed you the king's food. You're going to drink the king's wine. And Daniel, the Bible says Daniel takes it, he says his heart would not, he wouldn't be defiled by the things of the king. And he goes, and you'll see this theme a lot throughout the story, that he's given favor with this person that's in charge of them. And Daniel goes and he says, listen, we, j- we just want vegetables and water. Can you just give us vegetables? This is the original, these are the first vegetarians, right? Like they had it right from the start. So if you're a vegetarian out there, I'm sorry that I've made fun of you all those years, okay? Daniel says, we, we just want vegetables and water. That's it. Give us that. And he's like, I can't, I can't do that. The king said that I have to give you this. Daniel says, give me 10 days. Give, give God 10 days. And after 10 days of giving us vegetables and water, you'll see that we're better than everyone else here. And so they eat vegetables and water for 10 days. And at the end of the 10 days, the Bible says that they are better in appearance and strength. They look younger. They look stronger. They're wiser than everyone else there. That's been fattened up by all this beef and wine and everything. I'm just saying. It's biblical. <laughs> and in chapter 2, all, we see this, the start of Daniel's ministry where he's interpreting, interpreting dreams for the king. And they're shown favor. And God starts to move and starts to bless these young men. And in chapter 3, we pick up the story where King Nebuchadnezzar has built this statue of himself, this idol of himself that he commands people to worship. And he says, when the music plays, you will bow down and you will worship this statue. And if you don't, you're going to get thrown into a fiery furnace. What a horrible way to go. Like, I'll take the lions. Can I get the lions? Like the fiery furnace? I don't, I don't know which is worse. And we know, if you read the story, and we're going to dig into it a little bit, we know that the music plays and these three Hebrew children don't bow down. And that's where we pick up the story. In verse 12, these three Hebrew children get told on. There's a tattletale amongst them. And in verse 12, it says, these men go to the king and says, there are certain Jews whom you have appointed over the administration of the province of Babylon, namely Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men pay no attention to you. They do not serve your gods or worship the golden image which you have set up. Side note, this is not one of my points. You know that when you start doing the things that God has called you to do, people will tell on you. People will go to your boss. People will go to your teacher, to your principal, to your coach. People will go to people that you know and say, well, you know they don't, they don't believe the same thing that you believe. You know that they don't serve the same things that you. People will start to tell on you when you start doing the things that God has called you to do. And there are a few things through this story that I think that we can learn as we watch the providential hand of God move and eventually watch the sovereign hand come in and intersect with that. And there are a few things that I think that we can learn from Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego, and they are simply this. They would not, even to save their lives, commit a single act of adultery, of adultery, of idolatry, or adultery, (laughs) either, either. Just put a little line and write both of them. That's for somebody out there. God just dropped that in my head. God sees. Be sure your sins will find you out. That's a word. See, what happens is, is we, we've become so used to, I've been so used to looking at my notes to read, and now we have to look at this stupid screen back there, and it messes me up, right? But that's a word for somebody out there. They would not commit a single act of idolatry, even if it meant saving their lives. You see, These three Hebrew children had convictions. They understood that they weren't just Israelites in name, but they were Israelites in God. It's a question that we need to ask ourselves because I have to tell you the honest truth is I know a lot of Christians who have no convictions. I know a lot of Christians who are Christians by name, but not by the God that they serve. 
And you can go and you can Google poll after poll after poll after poll that will tell you that 60, 70 percent of Americans identify themselves as Christians. But then you look at America and the state that we're in and you know that that is by name only and not by conviction. These three Hebrew children had convictions. And when you have convictions, you stand to them. And you stand tall and you stand strong in them. See, listen, it would be really easy for them to quiet their conscience with excuses. I I got a couple of excuses, right? The the first excuse is everybody's doing it. Everybody's doing it. It, it, it's, It's no big deal because everyone's doing it. Everyone's going here. Everybody's watching that. Everybody's listening to that. Everybody's doing this. Everybody's doing that. It's it's no big deal. Well, why not? We hear this excuse all the time. The second excuse is, after all, it's political, not spiritual. It's political. It's not spiritual. I, 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 listen, I have to, I don't know if I should step away from this or not. I, I don't want to be political with you. I know we say that all the time, and then it's like, well, here we go again. Okay. I thought it was just the old guy that did that. Listen, Listen, I am sick and tired of seeing people, especially Christians, on social media telling me to keep God out of politics. I'm sick of people telling me, well, you know, Jesus isn't a Republican or a Democrat. Yeah, I know, because Jesus is Lord. He's the King of kings, the Lord of lords. He's in heaven, seated at the right hand of the Father. I understand that. I'm not an idiot. But I also understand that there are principles and there are values that the Bible teaches about that are political and that there are things that Jesus talked about, cared about, appreciated, and loved like the sanctity of life and of marriage and all these different things that are political things. And so for us as Christians to think to ourselves, well, you know what, I can just follow the crowd because it's political, it's not spiritual. If we are followers of Christ, Everything we do is spiritual. The way that we vote, the way that we do things, the things that we watch, the things that we listen to, everything that we do should be spiritual. And so if I go about my life saying, I'm a follower of Christ, what does the Bible tell me? What does the Bible want me to do? How does the Bible want me to talk, act, react, vote? How does the Bible want me to do these things? I can't separate the two. It's impossible. You can't take your Christian clothes off to go do something and then step back and put your Christian clothes back on. This is who Christ created you to be. And these are the excuses that we use, especially in the season that we're in right now. These are the excuses that we use. The third excuse is we can can bow so people won't question God will know our heart. Listen, I have to be honest with you, I've, I've used this one before. I, I've been in rooms where I should have spoke up and said, hey, don't talk about that in front of me, I'm a Christian. I've been in places where there's been something on the TV or on the movie screen, and I'm like, eh, I probably shouldn't be here right now, but, you know, God knows my heart. I close my eyes, I fast forward through that bit. You know, like, God, know, God knows my heart, it's okay. We use this excuse all the time. When there's an opportunity at work, at school, in a social setting to step up and say, listen, I'm a Christian, could you not talk about that? Or, hey, I'm going to go sit over here because I'm a Christian, I don't really need to hear that. Or, I don't. But we say, oh, you know, God, I don't, I don't want them, like, I'm just going to bow because I don't want them to think weird about me. I don't want them to judge me. I don't want to lose friends over this. You know my heart. God, you know my heart. You know, like you see the innermost parts of my being, God. You, you know my heart. And sometimes God's like, yeah, it's weak. (laughs) I know your heart. (laughs) It stinks. We make excuses in order to kind of ease our conscience. Listen, this is a a $100 slide. You want to take a picture of this one. Stop worrying about what other people think. Often we miss opportunities to do God's work because we get caught in the what ifs. People of religious principle don't ask if they will be misunderstood, but what is their duty to God? Compromise in a question of right or wrong is the mental deceit of the weak and unworthy. When we compromise our convictions and what we believe in in order to please the crowd or in order to not make a fuss 
or to order to just, well, you know, I don't want to be misunderstood. I don't want people asking me questions. I don't want to have any trouble. That's when we begin, our relationship with God begins to fade into something weak and frail and something that won't last. They had convictions and they would not, even to save their lives, commit a single act of idolatry. The second thing is they refused to debate about their actions. This is also a word for somebody. We need to shut up sometimes, right? We just need to be quiet every now and then. Look at verse 16 as the king is questioning them about their actions. It says, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answer the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to answer you on this point. Listen, there's something to be said for when you make a decision and you say, I made this decision because I'm a follower of Christ. That's enough. It really is. I see people on Facebook. I see people on social media. I see people in person at times making a statement or posting something or, or, or posting an article or a picture or whatever. And then it's like there's like 68 comments and they're going back and forth with people about, well, why do you believe this? Why can't you believe that? You realize that if on the bottom of there you just put, I believe this because I'm a follower of Jesus and then never responded again, that's enough of an answer. I'm just saying, he's Jesus. He's called me to this. He's shown me in his word. Put a scripture on there to go with whatever it is that you're posting and then just leave it. There's no need to debate about it at times. Listen, our declining even to discuss the course of action, even when it is plainly and instinctively recognized by the conscious, is a proof of religious firmness and consistency. Listen, our, our conscience, we, we post something or we say something, and we know this is what the Bible says. This is why it's true. This is what God says. And we, in our human flesh, we say, i got to argue with this person because they're so stupid. i got to argue with them. But the minute that we take a step back and we say, I'm not going to debate about this. This is what God has called me to do. This is what God has called me to say. This is what God has called me to take the next step in my life, in my faith, in my walk. And if that's what God has called me to do, then that's enough. That's what God's called me to do. End of story. End of discussion. And that's where Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are in this moment. They refuse to debate about their actions. The third thing is they trusted completely in God's providence. We've talked about it over the last few weeks, right? The providential hand of God, these these everyday things that take place and that happen. And Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego are an example of trusting completely in this. They said, we made a choice. God's in control. Sometimes we got to step back and just let God be God. So often we try to, we, oh, I'm going to fix this, or I'm going to do this, or I'm going to make sure this and this, and line it up all perfect. Sometimes we got to say, man, this is God's providence. This is what God wants to do. And if that's what God wants to do, then, then that's what God's going to do, because he's God. Verse 17, it says, if it be so, our God whom we serve is able to rescue us from the furnace of blazing fire, and he will rescue us from your hand, O King. They're sitting there saying, this is the decision that we've made, and if this is the decision that we made, we're just trusting God. We're, we're moving forward. The providential hand of God is with us, and we're moving forward. This is what God has called us to do, and so this is what we've done, and I'm not going to worry about it. I'm going to trust completely in God's providence. The foundational basis of God's protection over us is rooted in his sovereign working of his plan in every detail. Fear and worry thrive when our view of God is too small, too narrow, or too tiny. God will use each of our troubles to accomplish his purpose in our lives. And if we don't believe our trouble is there to grow us, we will waste it. Yeah. They said, listen, this, this is what I mean. This is what we've been talking about with the providential hand of God moving. Is that action, reaction. We decided not to bow. We knew the consequences, and so here we go. We're on the path that God, this is what God said is going to happen, so this is going to happen. So I'm not going to fear, I'm not going to worry because my God's big. My God's in control. My God's in charge. He's able to provide. He's able to protect. He's able to do these things, and they 
trust completely in the providence of God, that he will see them through. The fourth thing is they did not let the potential consequences change them. They say, listen, we believe because we trust completely in God's providence that God can save us. But in verse 18, they say, but if he does not, if he does not, let it be known to you, O king, that we are not going to serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Listen, when we hold to our convictions, no matter the consequences that follow, it shows the value of the relationship that we have with Jesus. They say, listen, we, we have convictions. We're, we're not going to bow down. And we're not going to debate about it. And we trust that God is in control and God is moving through this situation because God has called us to this. But even if God doesn't move sovereignly in this situation, even if we walk into that furnace and we die, we're okay with it because God's in control and because we trust God and they would not let the consequences change them. When men have felt, men or women, have felt their will enlightened by divine knowledge, awoken, and sanctified by the Holy Spirit's indwelling. They then choose God's service so firmly and joyfully that no earthly terrors can shake or move them from their sure foundation. When we awaken to the fact that God's divine knowledge is within us and we say, man, I am God-aware In my situation, in my difficulty, I am aware that God is with me, that he's gone before me, that he's behind me, that he's all around me. When I realize this in my life and the Holy Spirit awakens within me, when I realize these things, all of a sudden, the fears of man are, they're nothing to me. Why? I got God on my side. I got God walking with me. I got God moving in my life. And you'd think in this story, as you follow along through it, you go, oh, well, I know exactly what's going to happen. The king is going to be so amazed by their way that they stand up and the way that they follow their God that the king is going to let them go. This whole story is going to end well. This is going to be amazing because they're taking a stand and the king is just he's going to be so proud of them for the stand that they take but that doesn't happen the king gets mad really mad and he turns the fire up he says turn that fire up crank it up so much so that the guards that are taking them to the fire they die because the fire is so hot it's they he turns up the heat right and every bible preacher that I ever heard growing up, you want a good Bible joke? And then their name was changed for the third time to snap, crackle, and pop, all right? (laughs) I'm telling you, Bible jokes, they're the best. (laughs) The fifth thing, and what I like to call the moment, they honored God before the world, and God honored them. This is the moment. This is what we've been talking about over the last few weeks, the moment where Esther decides, listen, Mordecai, Mordecai says, it, if it's not you, it's going to be someone else. But what if, it, what if it's you? What if this is such a time as this? And, and it's Elijah getting up and going and the widow's oil and the bread never running out. It's the moment where they say, we're not going to bow We're not going to debate about it. We trust that God's in control. But even if he doesn't want to save us, we're still not going to bow. They honor God before the world, and all of a sudden, God honors them. Daniel chapter 3, verses 24 and 25. Then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished and rose up in haste. He declared to his counselors, did we not cast three men bound into the fire? They answered and said to the king, true, O king. He answered and said, but I see four men unbound walking in the midst of the fire, all, all and they are not hurt. And the appearance of the fourth is like the son of the gods. Jesus is walking in this. If you don't have goosebumps when you read this, you need to have a moment with Jesus real quick. I'm just telling you, I can hardly read it without getting choked up because you got to have an imagination to think. I, I, I love that it says they're walking, but I think they were strutting. I think they were doing something. I think they were dancing. I don't know what they were doing. They were walking, tiptoeing. I don't know what they were doing. Moonwalking through, I, something. 
They were doing something cool, right? This is the moment where we see the providential hand of God moving that says every action deserves a reaction. You decided not to bow, you're going to get thrown in the furnace. And if you're okay with that, I'm okay. God, if you're okay with that, I'm okay with that. But then all of a sudden, the sovereign hand of God comes and intersects with it. And Jesus is walking around in the fire with them. They are unharmed, unburned, and they're walking around in the fire. This is the moment. And like we've been talking about every single week, it doesn't mean that it's going to happen all the time. It happens. But when it happens, man, it happens. And God steps into their situation, and all of a sudden, these two hands of God intersect, and these men are saved, and they're honored. Listen, as unholy compromises and cowardly denials lead to shame and confusion, so unflinching courage and acting upon religious principles leads to happiness and honor. I'm I'm telling you, like I said, I'm 35. I've been through some stuff. I understand. Some of you guys have been through worse than I have. But you know, if you're a follower of Christ, when you're going through that, if you really have faith and you really trust in God, I'm not saying it's happy through the whole thing, but there are moments in those trials, and especially when you look back, that, man, you just get happy. You you got a sense of happiness that said, man, I trusted God through that. 99% of people wouldn't have trusted God through that, but I trusted God. You give yourself a little pat on the back, and you say, I trusted God through that. God saw me through that. And when we come out the other side, we look back at it and we go, God, I thank you that you brought me through that. And all of a sudden, honor is brought into our life because God says, I saw you through that and you stuck with me. Now I can honor you and I can show you even more. Listen, look at what they accomplished. Look at what they accomplished through this moment, right? Number one, they are safely protected from the slightest harm of the fiery furnace. We've, we've talked about it over the last few weeks that God is in the details, and I love the fact that God is in the details. The, the, the fact that, that the river dries up and he tells Elijah to go, but the city that he goes to is specific, and the place that he goes to is specific, and the widow that he goes to is talked about later on in the Bible, and it's specific, specific, specific stuff. The Bible says that their ropes burned off, but the fire didn't touch them. And that when they got out, they didn't even smell like smoke. Who cares, right? Like who writes like who writes that? Like they're walking around in the fire with Jesus. We don't care that they don't smell like smoke. I mean, I hate when I get home from a bonfire the way I smell. I leave my clothes outside and I take a shower. I don't like it. I've smelled burnt flesh before. It's not pretty. So I mean, I get it. But like, why does the Bible say? Because God's in every single detail. God says, I'll not only take you into the fire, I'll walk with you in it, and I'll make sure that whatever had you bound up is is off, and when you get out, you don't even smell like you used to smell because you've been in my presence. This is the God that we serve. This is the providential protection that God brings, that they are safely protected from even the slightest harm in the fiery furnace. The second thing is that the Son of God blesses them with His company, that they are walking around in the fire with the Son of God. And the best part is, is that He promises us the exact same thing, that He will walk with us. Isaiah 43 says, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you, and through the rivers, they will not overwhelm you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be scorched, nor will the flame burn you. God will walk through you, will walk with you through your trials. He will see you. He will meet you in the midst of them if you'll just trust him and you'll hold to your convictions. The third thing that they accomplished is their persecutor, Nebuchadnezzar, honors them. In verse 30, you can read the story for yourself. You should read the whole story for yourself, but in verse 30, he promotes them. No joke. He promotes them. I wonder if when they got out and he hugged them, he was like, ow, 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 like, you guys are really hot. You know, I don't know. (laughs) He promotes them. Why? Because they honored God before the world, and so God honored them. 
I remember my papa preaching it when I was, when I was a kid, and I, I went to my dad this week, and I said, hey, what's that sermon papa used to preach? He goes, I don't I remember one or two points. So we messaged my papa, and we said, hey, what's that sermon you used to preach? And my papa used to preach this, that through the fire they knew freedom, they knew fellowship, and they knew fulfillment. Right? They knew freedom from the ropes that bound them and freedom from the flames around them. They knew fellowship with God in the midst of the fire, and they knew fulfillment in the fact that God met them, but they were also promoted when they got out in their earthly life. Right. We always think, oh, you know, God, I just want you to, I just want you to bless me. Just fill me up and, and just show me your grace and mercy. God will bless you in those ways, but he'll also bless you in your earthly life as you honor him. The problem is, is that we usually don't have enough conviction to get to this point, right? After point one or point two, it's like, oh, okay, yeah, I can handle those. But then point three, point four come, we're like, eh, that looks hot. <laughs> Listen, I'm deathly afraid of being burned. I burnt my finger once on one of these stupid pots that the, the thing, the handle only had the rubber from here to here, and then the, the bottom was still metal. I don't know who made that pot. Some, some C student made that pot. <laughs> and so I went to grab the pot, and this finger was on the metal, and I have never felt pain. I, I'm likening it. I would imagine it's like childbirth. Uh, <laughs> but it hurt so bad that every time you can ask my wife, she'll have like a, a hot pan or something, and she'll be like, ugh, and I'm like, ah, you know, like, I don't... It freaks me out. I hate, I hate it. I don't like, like, I don't drink coffee. I don't drink anything hot because I get scared, like, when it comes to my, I don't like it, right? And so, listen, I'm afraid of that. We're the same way in our spiritual lives. There are things that we're afraid to do for God because of the consequences that will come from it, and we can't make it this far to watch God's sovereign hand move in our life and do something miraculous because we're too scared about, well, I don't want to get burned, or I don't want to get left, or I don't want to get... We need to be people that have conviction and believe enough in the God that we serve that says, I know that God is going to protect me. I know that the providential hand of God will watch over me, will see me through this. And every now and then, if I keep trusting in him, I keep honoring him, and I keep holding on to him, his sovereign hand will intersect with that, and he'll do something in my life that I could never see coming, that I can look back on for years to come and say, God was there. In that moment, God was there with me. The question that we need to ask ourselves, is our religion one of fashion, form, education, or one of reality and principle? If based on material things, then in times of trial, we shall fall away. If on God, then we shall, by His grace, be kept steadfast. Christians, should always be prepared to face the fires of temptation at some period of their career. All it will do is strengthen and purify your faith. All the fire is going to do is purify you. All the difficulty is going to do is strengthen your faith in God. If you hold fast to Him and to the convictions that He's placed in your heart, you say, God's forgiven me for all the foolishness that I've done. The least, thing, the least that I can do is continue to hold on to Him through this difficulty that I face. And as you do that, God will begin to honor you. He'll begin to bless you. And He will walk through the fire with you. Run through it. Dance through it. However you want to go through it. God will go through it with you. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank You for this day. We thank You for the people that are here in your house. We thank you for the people who are watching, watching online, listening to this message. I know that there are people today, God, that need to know that you are there in the fire with them. They're going through a difficult time. They've got surgeries coming up. They've got cancer in their body. They've got a loss of a loved one. They've got financial turmoil. Their relationship is a mess. Whatever it is, God, we know that you can meet them today in their fire. So I pray that you would do that. I pray that they would feel your presence in a way that they have never felt before, that you would do a work, and that as your providential hand moves in their lives, as they continue to obey you and trust in you, that the sovereign hand would come alongside and would do something amazing in their lives, that they would look back and go, there is no way that that could have happened without God intervening. 
I pray that you would show people this today, God, and that you would move in their hearts and in their lives. Continue to watch over our church. Continue to be with our people. Keep them healthy. Keep them safe. As they depart, go their separate ways. Help them to have a great day. In Jesus' name, amen.